Do we have a recording started? We're good? Okay. So uh, today we have an exciting guest, um, Vijay Pandey. Did I say your last name correctly? Yes, yes you do. And, uh, you know, he's really one of the world's experts um, on the intersection between computer science and biotech. And uh, Dr. Pandey is a general partner in Andreessen Horowitz. And he's leading the firm's investments um, across the section of biology and computer science. I think he actually started the, uh, the biotech fund. Is that right? That's right, yes. Or, and we, we call it the bio fund because bio it fund. really, in my mind, is much more broad than just biotech, more than like pills and devices. Okay. Okay, cool. So we can talk about that a bit. Um, he is also the founder of Folding at Home, which is a distributed computing project for disease research. And um, let's see, a variety of other things. Um, he's been the founder and advisor to a number of Silicon Valley startups as well. So we can talk about uh, some of your experience in the... Yeah, and it was in my first startup at 15. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. So yeah, thanks for joining. Um, maybe just to get started, we can talk a bit about um, what is what is the latest things that you're seeing that are exciting at the intersection of uh, computer science and biotech? And let's start with that. Yeah, you know, I think when we were actually thinking about starting the fund, you know, which now is like a year and a half ago when we were talking about it, what we were starting to see then, and I think which has very much come to fruition over the last, you know, 12 to 18 months, is this integration between machine learning and biology and healthcare. And if you think about it, you know, what does machine learning need? Machine learning needs tons of data and something that you could do that's actually really useful. Something that if you actually could learn something, you could actually turn that into something valuable um, uh, to monetize. And healthcare is something where it's a huge industry. You know, you think of like when Larry and Sergey were creating Google, they're going after this $300 billion ad budget, which is a big market. But healthcare in the U.S. is $3 trillion. So there's like 10 Google scale like businesses, you can imagine, that could come out of that. And because people are so risk averse, healthcare is still literally in a sort of dot matrix printer fax machine kind of era. I mean, it's not an analogy, it's like quite literally that. Uh, and so with that in mind, there's the opportunity for something like machine learning when it's becoming so, uh, so powerful to come in. But there are also obvious challenges. So um, let's talk about that. Like, uh, how, you know, what are the most useful applications of applying machine learning to, bio, to drug discovery and these kind of things? I mean, we use machine learning internally for fraud prevention, for example, but we don't use um, deep learning. And I know that's something that you've done a bunch of research on. Like, yeah, let's talk about that. Like, what are, basically, if you apply machine learning or deep learning to biotech or bio, what are, what are the things that pop out? Like, what are the most interesting problems yeah. to solve? Yeah, I think there's two challenges here. The first challenge is what can the technology actually do? And the second challenge is what can you actually get reimbursed and make money for? Okay. You know, and so, uh, you know, especially coming from, uh, you know, half of my life is a very academic life. We think about, like, what can technology do? And it seems really cool. And even that is, is really interesting. If you think about deep learning, typically that's applied to images right now. And part of the reason why is that it's very easy to codify an image into something that a computer can understand. Um, it's different than, say, codifying a drug into a computer or, or other things where the featureization maybe is less obvious. But for images, you know, it's pretty obvious. And right now, deep learning for images typically does better at, at let's say, identifying things than individual human beings do. And so, you know, doesn't, uh, it seems very natural then that one could think of, well, so much of being a doctor is visual. So much of med school and, and your training afterwards is just seeing thousands of images. You might be a dermatologist and you're, you're doing a, a selector between, you know, is that malignant or is that benign? And that's just seeing thousands of images and training your, your neural net. And so for anything that's visual, dermatology, ophthalmology, radiology, it's very natural that uh, machine learning could play a role. But then there's a second problem, which is, okay, it can play a role, but can you make it fit within the existing system? The analogy I usually give is that actually, if we didn't have to deal with all the peculiarities of our roads. Let's say we could build a whole new highway system that was only for self-driving cars. So no bicycles, no pedestrians, no human drivers, all that stuff. Actually, we could probably do that right now. And we have the tech for that right now, and it'll work just fine. It's just that might cost like a couple trillion dollars, and so we're never going to do that, or maybe more than that, especially around here to build new roads. So instead, you have to work within the system. Same thing happens with healthcare, is that you can't just like toss out the existing system, especially since there are literally lives at stake, and so you people are going to be risk averse. And so now the question is, what can you do that fits in, exi in the existing system? If you have something that's better than a radiologist, how do you get radiologists to adopt it? Right, uh, and, and, and so how do you fit into the system? 
Yeah, I mean, that's that strikes me as something that's true about a lot of entrepreneurship. It's like, um, it's oftentimes, like maybe half the problem is technology or building something better, and the other half is like, how do you work within the legal framework? How do you get a wedge and actually get people to adopt it? And like, yeah, as a, as a VC, I'm sure you talk with lots of entrepreneurs and you see people who are kind of uh, strong in one area, but not the other. And like, I don't know, maybe you can talk about that a bit. Like what, when you see startups that someone has built a better mousetrap, but they have no kind of like um, go to market strategy, yep. like what, do you, what are the things that you advise them on? Yeah, you know, it's very common, especially since, you know, I still have very strong ties at Stanford uh, and still have, I run a lab at Stanford that, you know, I meet, let's say, a canonical person might be someone with a PhD at Stanford, either in computer science or maybe in biology or chemistry. And so they've got this great technology. And what they might not realize is that there's a big jump between technology and a product and a big jump from product and sales and, and then actual real mar uh, product market traction. And that traction is a really difficult thing because I may have my own intuition as an investor about that traction, but the market is, in the end, is the one that's going to say. And so what we typically do, and I think this is very much sort of the software or Silicon Valley VC style, is that we'll put a little bit of money in if they have a great technology and a great product idea. And that's like a large seed, um, a seed uh, investment for us. But by the Series A, we'd want to see them having some sort of really well-defined go-to-market. And then at the next round, we'd want to see them have traction that go to market. And so what's happening here is at each stage, we're putting in more and more money as they make more and more progress. This is different than what typically happens, say, in traditional biotech, where you have to put a lot of money in and you have no signal for whether it's working or not. You just have you know, science advancing or like clean tech. You have to put all this money in. And at the end, after 100 million or billion dollars, it's either amazing or, or nothing. Uh, here we can get progress along the way, and, and that's actually a key part of the way we think about this, and we think about technology to, par uh, to product, and also, frankly, what I think the opportunity is for what we're doing in bio, to take that approach and apply it to areas that typically this approach was never applied to. Yeah, is there an example company that comes to mind for you that's like, that was a really creative go-to-market strategy where they did something maybe that was really innovative on not just the tech side, but like the go-to-market? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, um, uh, this is where I, I, I'm, I'm really torn because there are some interesting examples where they're a little quiet right now. <laughs> uh, but maybe let me give an example of a company that is, is well known uh, that we work with, uh, Amada Health, uh, that actually I'm on the board of and we made investments in. So Amada is trying to save people from type 2 diabetes. And the way they do this is that they don't do this through a pill. You know, normally for so many of things that we have to deal with, the uh, sort, of, um, sort of plan A is a pill. And for some things that make sense, like if you have a bacterial infection, uh, there's not going to be an app that's going to save you. I think if you have a bacterial infection, it's kind of amazing that you can take a pill and instead of dying in a week, you can be fine in a week. And that's really the, the promise of modern medicine. And the reason why is that like mice models and biology is really well understood there. But for other areas in behavioral disease, let's say like depression or a PTSD or smoking sensation, there's not a really good great, not a really great mouse model for smoking sensation or PTSD. You know, that, that mice, you know, we don't understand mice PTSD, we don't understand mice smoking patterns and so on. Uh, and so there it's a very different thing, it's a behavioral disease. And so what Amana I think has been leading is the idea, and this is in the go to market, is that they will have a therapeutic that doesn't have, um, that doesn't have the downsides of a drug. <laughs> So it doesn't have toxicity because it's not a drug, it's a program that is catalyzed by computation with coaches and games and, and, and education and tutorials. And it's driven off of something that existed before, the CDC's Diabetes Prevention Program, or DPP. And so in a sense, by putting all these computational pieces together, they've created what um, we would call a digital therapeutic. And you know, most people's reaction is like, okay, that sounds fine, but like, I want the drug. The interesting thing is if you compare Omada's DPP to the leading drug, metformin, for diabetes, it exceeds metformin in efficacy. And so how is this possible? Well, one, um, just, you know, you think about all the A-B testing that most people do, like, you know, all like Amazon webpage probably has been massively A-B tested. Omada can A-B test every little thing in a way that a drug company can't. A drug company can't every week take 10,000 people and try A versus B. And Omada can easily do that. So they've <laughs> better and better and better. And they can have a go to market where they say to self-insured employee and self-insured employers uh, uh, that, you know, every worker of yours that gets type 2 diabetes, that's 10K to 15K hit to your bottom line. You know, something a CFO really notices. And say, look, only pay us 
if we actually help them. And we'll monitor them and, and, we'll, and you can see uh, who we're helping. You know, no drug company would do that. And so in terms of a go-to-market, it's sort of like, oh, that's a, like a no-brainer for them. And they need to do this sort of innovative go-to-market because this is unusual. But the idea that it's not toxic, so you can do tons of testing and you can bring in A-B testing, which is kind of like clinical trials, you know, but just done computationally. You bring that in, you get a better uh, product, and now it gets really sticky. And so that's maybe one example of something which you don't see in a traditional therapeutic space that you could do here. Yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, it strikes me that it's kind of like what you're saying is that when you enter the regulated world of doing uh, tests on humans, clinical trials, it's like, um, you know, perhaps right, rightfully so, there's a lot more regulation yeah. around that. And yeah. so, you know, things are safer, but the pace of innovation maybe slows a bit. Yeah, imagine like if every time Google wanted to tweak their search engine, they had to get regulatory approval. You know, I mean, that would obviously slow them down. And so it's interesting to think how computation, and, and the idea is nobody wants to actually hurt people, obviously, and nobody wants there to be a disaster, like a PR disaster where something hurt people. And so part of this has to be some way not to skirt regulation, but to make it not, not necessary because this is just not a problem. I think that's what it has to be. So, you know, we're, we're operating a company in a regulated space, and we think a lot about um, how do we be, be the most trusted brand in the space? How do we think longer term than anyone? Um, you know, we were one of the first companies to reach out to regulators, try to build those relationships, be an educational resource. Um, and I think that's been a good strategy for us. But I'm curious, are there any, um, in the world of the FDA, a different regulator, a different industry, you know, are there any um, cautionary tales? Like, what's a company that you think stumbled and had a setback, and maybe what's one that had a really good strategy in a regulated market? Yeah, I mean, I think here there are a lot of similarities with regulation. I mean, there's a couple ways to break it down. First off, I think about the difference between national versus local, and if there's any opportunity for regulatory arbitrage. Uh, so a company like Airbnb or Lyft or Uber, because so much of that is decided locally, if San Francisco wanted to ban Lyft and Uber, there are many other cities. And so that gives some opportunity. The problem with uh, a lot of uh, things on the medical side is that it's all national. So if the FDA comes in and says this is not safe, you know, you're, you're dead in the water. And so obviously in that case, it's a different type of game. And I think the game that I would strongly suggest is to, and it sounds like this is what you're doing as well, is to work with regulators from the very beginning. And actually, we've had great experience. Uh, there's actually a Stanford FDA collaboration that I'm a part of on the Stanford side where FDA has a team at Stanford and wants to be a part of Silicon Valley. And I think all of my interactions, and especially the people that work underneath me, have always come back from them actually pleasantly surprised because they actually want to help people too, obviously. And it's not like, I think it's a mistake when this is seen as adversarial. Uh, when we can partner with them, uh, you know, we would had pushback, like we were talking about machine learning in, in diagnostics, and they would ask questions like, oh, would the diagnostic get better as you get more data? And we're like, oh yeah, absolutely. And then they were brainstorming ways to help make that possible from a regulatory point of view. And so I think when we work together, I think everyone's incentives are aligned. And especially if we can get to the point where we can have a huge win for them. Uh, I think uh, that's also a win for us. Uh, like, you know, we come up with a new scheme for handling digital therapeutics. We come up with a new scheme for handling uh, machine learning in, 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 in diagnostics. Uh, that could be just a wonderful thing and actually could set the world moving in the right direction. Yeah, that um, strikes me as like the right approach is, you know, I, I imagine people who get into the FDA, they do it because they wanted, they wanted to help people. It's yeah. like they actually the, goal, the end goal is the same. Um, so there's probably a way to create a win for all on that one. I think yeah. that's the question, how to create that. And I think that's what we should be asking ourselves. Um, okay, so maybe uh, just, I'm curious about this topic of, um, you know, healthcare and biotech and how fast we see innovation there versus other sectors like, uh, like software or consumer tech or whatever. And, um, you know, so you, in reason for it was decided to start this bio fund um, and chose you to run it. I guess maybe can you talk about like how, what is the difference between investments that happen in that space and more in like the consumer tech space? Yeah, you know, I mean, you think about what we do. Um, we are typically in the language of a software VC doing B2B and B2B2C enterprise sales. 
you know, so you know, typically we might be uh, the these startups will be working with other um, other providers of healthcare that work with consumers. So in a B two B two C, or maybe occasionally some of them are direct to consumer, but those are the most challenging and the ones that I think are most fraught with regulations. Uh, I think part of the challenge that we've seen in sort of consumer driven healthcare companies is that either you have to make clinical claims that the FDA will knock you down on because you're just not prepared to do that and you need to have a doctor in the loop, or you can't make clinical claims and now you're just making general wellness claims and maybe it's not all that useful. And so I think part of this is uh, typically falling, therefore, just more, more of this enterprise play. Uh, but with that in mind, these are typically, so I'm, in, I'm running two investment theses, one of which is machine learning in, in healthcare and biology broadly. And this looks much like any other machine learning company. You know, Alex Rampella is our, our uh, GP who specializes in fintech. And, you know, I see a lot of similarities between the two because there may be, like what you're talking about, fraud protection. You know, machine learning can play a huge role there. You can do things that you couldn't do before, but you have to have domain experience. And so instead of fintech domain experience, uh, we would be doing bio, but there's similarities. There's a second thesis that I'm very curious about, which I think might be more relevant for the next few years, which is major advances in biology, major scientific advances. So there's one company that we did invest in, which I put into this bucket. It's a company called Appeal, which is actually a material science team from UC Santa Barbara, like one of the best material science programs in the world, that was taking ideas that were originally intended for designing solar cells and applying it to uh, a coverage that uh, is safe and, and, and can even be organic that, and is nanoscopic that can make fruits and vegetables last three times longer. And so this could actually be a, a huge impact into, the, into world hunger, into the trillion dollar food waste. It's something that is driven because it's a different type of uh, scientific advance uh, from a different area being applied here. But we're seeing all these other interesting things in biology, you know, CRISPR, stem cells. Uh, you know, CRISPR allows you to edit genes, which is kind of amazing. Stem cells, you can pull your blood. And from your blood, let's say we pulled uh, uh, some of my blood, and we could create new organs out of that that would be my organs for my own DNA. And let's say I had some problem, not only can we create one of my organs, if you mix stem cells and CRISPR, you could create one of my organs that's actually better than one of my organs. You know, and so on. And so but how would it be better? It just well, was stronger? Let's, or? Yeah, let's say I have some mutation which gives me a disease. Let's say I have cystic fibrosis, which, and, uh, and that means I have major uh, lung damage. Uh, imagine growing lungs that doesn't have the CFDR mutant. And unlike other organ transplants where, um, you know, if I had to give you an organ, you'd have to be on immunosuppressants for the rest of your life. Uh, if I could give you one of your own organs, this wouldn't be a problem. And so it's interesting. People also think about brave new worlds in biology and healthcare in terms of longevity and what I would call like youth extension, or life, not just life extension. So much of this, I think, is healthcare is going to be, think, there will be a lot of interesting opportunities. And things are moving so fast. The question is now back to what we talked about before, where's the product market fit? Is this a crazy, uh, interesting technology, but is there a real product that can work inside the system? And so that's why I think this is early, but I think there will be a lot of excitement in this space, you know, in the next decade. Interesting. So, man, so many questions that could go from there. <laughs> um, do you think, I mean, how, how real is this idea of, of life extension or youth extension? I mean, what sort of time frames are we thinking about? Yeah, it's so early that I think it's really impossible to tell. And I think there's, there's, I think, a couple conflating things. First off is that a lot of people view this as like a luxury for rich people. But I think as this becomes more mainstream, the goal of healthcare is life extension, right? Except the problem is the way healthcare is thought about these days, it's about fee for service. So you only see your doctor when you're sick because that's how they're reimbursed. They're not incented until very recently just to keep you alive as long as possible. They're incented to deal with problems. Um, and so, you know, because of that, uh, we have the system that we have. I think the shifting of thinking about changing incentives, which actually instead of fee for service to fee for value creates, this actually is something that could fit within the existing healthcare system um, in, in that uh, mentality. Now the question is what technologies are possible. And so one version of it is to slow aging. And that's one thing that's interesting. And I could see that working. Another version is that if I asked you to like, um, you know, or ask Elon Musk to create a Tesla that could last 100 years, uh, I don't know if his approach would be 
I'm going to design all these parts that could last 100 years, or his design would be, well, I'm going to make it super modular, let's just keep on cycling things out, and things will wear out and break, and I'm just get new ones. And so that's where actually the organ and other replacements gets really interesting. Um, and now if you want to go like super crazy, which is always fun to talk about, but I think not something to worry about over the next uh, few decades, is the idea that as machine learning gets stronger and as people start to understand the connectome, the fantasy is even to the point where you can understand a human brain that you could replicate it. And so you could replicate like one of our brains and that would be yet another replacement part. Right, so that's probably the hardest one to swap out because you need to get the state out of the old one into the new one. Yeah, yeah, backups are, try are really hard. Yeah. <laughs> but version control will be really useful. Yeah. Forking and, you know, all these things, the branches, you know. Yeah, I wouldn't mind reverting back a few commits. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> interesting. Okay. Um, so, man, there's so many places we could go from there. So, um, hmm. I guess, like, one question that I've had in the back of my mind is, like, do we, what is the state of our understanding of like cell biology and the human body and all that? Like, yeah. I feel like other sciences are sort of more well understood. Like, so this is a great question because it brings up, I think, a really fundamental point, which is, you know, certain areas like physics, and actually, most of my degrees are in physics. Physics is nice because, in the end, there is the possibility to make things simple. Like, with Newton, it's F equals MA. With quantum mechanics, it's relatively elegant and simple. We, all the way down, it's pretty simple. Um, biology is not, is, is not simple at all. It's so complicated that we often don't even think we know all the actors in play. Um, and, you know, whereas for an atom, we got neutrons, we got protons, we got electrons, we're done. You know, and, and chemistry, we don't understand all the actors and so on. And so one of the things that we're starting to see, and this is where machine learning ties back into the picture, is that biology right now aspires to be the study of life on Earth. But actually, when I look at how biology is done, it's, I don't think it's a study of life on Earth. It's a study on life on Earth as conceptualized by human beings. And if you have something that's super, super complicated that you can't like see the matrix and load it up into your head, um, you're gonna have to simplify it. And what happens when you simplify it? Well, you get things like diagnostic tests that have low accuracy. So mammograms have 55% accuracy. PSA tests for a prostate has like 40% accuracy. And these accuracies are so low that they're being deprecated as early tests because the false positives are so high. And you tell a woman that she has breast cancer, and she goes through all of this stuff, and only until later find out that she's fine. You know, so, um, and the reason why is that these tests are really oversimplified because our understanding of biology is very simplified. What we're starting to see, and a great company in this space, uh, as an example, is a company called Freenome, which um, we've invested in. So Freenome can apply machine learning to biology, and what they're doing is learning new biology. Because machine learning, especially in this case deep learning, can learn things that a human being just couldn't put together. And ironically, it can do more data and you can be much more careful in how you handle regularization. When you, if you ask a biologist for their theory and ask them like, what did you do to regularize it? You know, how do you know you're not overfitting? Like they will often, if they're not familiar with those terms, you know, it's like, I have no idea what you're talking about. Whereas because we're doing this in a very repeatable way, um, we can do it the right way, we can handle a ton of data and then we can get better as we get more data. And so what happens then is accuracies that go up from like 40% to, you know, possibly 95%, 99%. And that's where the game changes dramatically. That's where Freenome could be the cure to cancer by having a test that costs a few hundred dollars that you take twice a year. And if you get stage one cancer, many cases 80, 90, 100% curable, and you just deal with it. Much like you go to the dentist, you have a cavity, you deal with it. Um, versus like spending your whole life never going to the dentist, 50 years later you have a mouthful of cavities and you want the dentist to fix your teeth. I mean, that's just not gonna work. Yeah, so it's preventative. So it, it almost seems like you're saying um, that deep learning could understand a system that's so complex, maybe the human brain is just not well equipped to even understand the system. Yep. Um, you know, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, my understanding is that if you apply a neural net or whatever, or uh, deep learning to a problem, it may build this model underneath, but you don't actually really understand the model. Like it's, yeah. it's spitting out an answer, but you don't understand yeah. the inner workings. One thing you can do is that people are building interpretable models where they're more linear instead of nonlinear, so it's easier for us to load up, and where it's more regularized, so a lot of parameters go to zero. And so those models are maybe not 95% uh, predictive, but maybe 85% predictive, but at least we can wrap it up in our heads because okay. we don't have like, a, a thousand parameters, we have maybe 10. 
and and then we have some chance to, to at least, I think that stuff is useful and important because I also want to stand and check the thing. And so it's interesting to see, does this fit with our current knowledge or is this something really new? Actually, it's super exciting to discover new biology and then go find it, go, go test it experimentally. Yeah, my sister told me this analogy one time about understanding biological systems where she said, it's almost like if you had a television like over there and it dropped down and some aliens were trying to figure out how this thing works. Yep. And they open up the back, there's all these wires and she's like, maybe you cut a wire yeah. and you see like the sound turned off and you're like, that's kind of interesting. You reconnect it and you cut another wire and it goes to black and white instead of, and you, you're just like basically turning bits and things off to see what happens, but it's kind of like a guess and check. Yeah, actually there's a really cool paper that came out recently where neuroscientists used neuroscience like signal processing to a simulator of a microprocessor. It was an 8008 or an 8080, an early microprocessor, which should be pretty simple, but more complicated than a TV. And it's interesting to see what they could pull out and what they couldn't. And it's just obviously really hard uh, to get all the detail just by looking at the signal traces of what's coming out. Interesting. So do you think, I'm just kind of wondering, does that mean that um, human brains might need to be uh, augmented to even understand biological systems fully? Yeah, I mean, you know, the funny thing about deep learning is that deep learning is just taking the next step from what traditional machine learning is because traditional machine learning is a human being comes up with the features and then you do like, uh, you know, SVMs or random forest or whatever on top. If the human being doesn't have the right features, you're fucked basically, right? Um, now with a deep, uh, with a DNN or other multi-layer networks, if you have the right way to input in, so for, let's say for images, it's easy, it's pixels. For genomics, that's almost as easy as just bases, you know? If you have the right way to lay it in, then instead of our neural nets coming up with the features, then the DNN comes up with the features, and then you, you go from there. I think what we'll find is that there will still be this interplay, especially in certain areas like in drug design, how do you encapsulate a drug? You know, I don't know if you've uh, taken organic chemistry, but you know, you have these atoms and they have bonds and so on, it's a graph. And so it's it's an unusual data structure, and so you can do conf nets on graphs, which is actually how we've handled my lab. But it's not it's not obvious what the right data structure is, and so there there will be some opportunities where we can use our insight and our codified knowledge uh, from taking all these courses in biology and chemistry, and use that to sort of still help the features along. But as things go, I bet we're going to codify more and more and more and more, uh, such that um, humans will play a different role, and that's going to be the question. I think this is now 50, 100 years out to be talking about it, but um, it will be very interesting. I think if humans can keep up with these schemes that we talked about, there will always be a role. But, uh, and it will be nothing, it won't be something where we just ML versus us. I think the exciting thing is how we augment ourselves. And the best humans will be the ones that can maybe connect to the ML the way that, you know, someone who's really good at searching Google can find things really fast. Yeah, this reminds me of like the neural lace idea or whatever Elon Musk talks about. Um, Cool, so let's shift gears for a minute. So uh, we talked a little bit about, uh, you and I before this talked a little bit about blockchain. Yep. And I'm curious how you think that might be applied to uh, healthcare and bio. Yeah, we're seeing a couple interesting applications. I mean, so uh, one of the things, uh, just as a quick example, is that a lot of times on the bio side, people wanna make predictions and make true predictions. And so they'll, let's say, take their prediction, hash the file and put the hash in the blockchain. So they can say, look, you know, I can really prove that I did this. And this sense of sort of being able to guarantee something like that, uh, this was one example, but there's many examples like that, that we'll see. I think the, the question is, and this is where sometimes, I think where blockchain is overplayed is where um, you, where a centralized database would do the same thing, you know, but where blockchain is important is where you need everybody to have proof. And I think there's tons of things in regulatory aspects and in biology aspects where proof is important. And, and so I would expect that we'd start to see blockchain be more and more used in those cases. Yeah, and specifically around like folding at home, um, which I believe is using people's spare computational power to do protein folding simulations. Yeah, that's which, right, and, and other things, um, machine learning and, and, uh, and drug design and a bunch of other things. Yeah. Okay, and maybe in a minute we can talk about protein folding and yep. why that's so important. Sure. Um, but, uh, you know, that's one of those problems where you're really trying to incentivize like millions of people around the world to do something um, and like to use their computer for this. So can you talk about that for how it might apply to digital currency or blockchain? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that um, we're seeing is that th there's this unused resource and that was the original pitch. Uh, so remember Folding Home, we started coding it in 99. 
you know, so uh, it's very old. I mean, it was re first released in October of 2000. So it's ex extremely old, you know, compared to other things that we have to deal with. Um, I'm still proud. I think I still have a little bit of code still left, although I sh I'm not that proud of that code uh, necessarily. Uh, but but uh, uh, so, you know, something that's been around for a while, and in the early days, you know, you had spare computer time and, and lots of power, so there's no way to exploit it. Nowadays, it's interesting because, you know, there's things like Gollum that we talked about that I think purports to be the Airbnb of computer time, you know, where you can sell it out. Um, I think the question has always been, uh, can you make enough money based on how much it costs to power them? And so there's been many attempts to, to uh, monetize distributed computing. And the, typically the problem is that running on Amazon is actually pretty cheap. And so that's what you're competing against. And it's cheap and, and very straightforward versus running on other people's computers is actually not that easy. Uh, where this curve may change is actually on mobile devices. The electricity usage on mobile is so low uh, that even when it's just plugged in, it's so low that actually now the cost curve is very different. And the, the performance of mobile, especially mobile GPUs, is actually not bad. And there are obviously so many mobile devices that there may be a play there. But uh, at least so far, that's been the thing that has killed it versus just using something like Amazon. And why is protein folding so important? And why is it such a computationally intense problem? Like, what's the potential if we're able to do it more yeah. efficiently? Yeah, and so, you know, with folding at home, people are now not trying to make five bucks by selling their computer to Gollum or something like that. They're donating that time to Stanford. Uh, so a nonprofit, and, and we do research, and then we publish the research, and, uh, and if it's interesting, this helps propel uh, other, uh, other groups to actually come up with drugs or, or we'll come up with drugs ourselves. So protein folding is trying to understand how proteins, these key molecules in our body, uh, which actually do all the work. They are the enzymes, they are antibodies, like, uh, uh, you know, they're, they're responsible for all the interesting things in biology for the most part. Um, but before they can be a little machine, they have to assemble themselves. One way to think about it is like on this nano scale, I mean, these things are like a thousand atoms big. It's really small. There's not let any little nano construction worker that can put these things together. They have to assemble themselves or self-assemble. And so protein folding is the process of self-assembly. So it's critical for biology, but then all the diseases that are really going to be the big challenges of the next 20 years, uh, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, MS, all these types of ALS, these diseases are all involved with protein misfolding. And so instead of folding, assembling correctly, they misassemble and then become dangerous and toxic. And so it is especially going after this that's on our minds. And for me, um, you know, uh, I have a history of, of, of relatives who've died of Alzheimer's. And so this is something that's very personal. I worry for my mom and, and eventually for myself and my kids. And, and it is going to be, I think, the biggest healthcare challenge especially as heart disease and cancer starts to become more and more a solved problem. And this is so unsolved problem, there's no drug for Alzheimer's disease. And, and we're gonna have you know, millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of people in the age group um, where we're gonna have to deal with, and it's such a horrible disease. It, a heart attack, as morbid as it is, you, you have a heart attack, you die, at least your family is not ripped apart. Alzheimer's, they have to watch you lose your memory. And it is just horrific. And so if, if we're able to essentially do protein folding simulations more efficiently, um, you know, maybe just connect the dots, like how, yeah, how, how does that actually translate into a... Yeah, so the problem with this is that if you, the benefit of simulating something is to be able to understand what's going on at a very small scale in a way that you couldn't experimentally. And this actually speaks to an interesting um, contrarian trend, because in the old days, all of compute was simulation. Now it's moved towards machine learning, like we're just gonna learn with tons of data. But actually the interesting contrarian trend is to do simulation because typically machine learning is great at interpolation and a little good at extrapolation. But the beauty of simulation is that knowing the uh, laws of physics and the fact that these are, I know the atoms and the protein, I can take care of the rest. And so I can do things no experimentalist can do, we can see things no one else can see because we have all that information. And I think we're gonna see a rise of simulation being a great counterpart to machine learning. And so an interesting company here that's in our portfolio is a company called Improbable in the UK, where they do simulations of, let's say, cities and of battles, uh, where like it's almost, think of a huge multiplayer game where the rules of how an individual behaves is understood, but what happens when we throw them all together? What happens when there's an earthquake in San Francisco? And then you can tie in actually, in addition to the simulation, real data. And, and, and run Monte Carlo simulations such that you can plan for things in ways that we don't have machine learning for what the next big earthquake is gonna look like here. 
And, and so, uh, so to, to tie it together, so simulation is critical because we can learn things we just couldn't do any other way. And, and so simulation is a biology that lets us learn these types of things. It is very expensive just because these things are just, the, the, the accuracy needed is so high. Uh, to, and so the level of computation is huge. Just a typical fast PC can simulate maybe um, 10 billionths of a second in a day. And you know you want to simulate a second or something like that. So it would take millions or billions of days. I start sounding like Carl Sagan, uh, you know, on, on a typical laptop. And so it's just because the accuracy is needed is so high. Um, it's because you're simulating the interactions of each molecule folding into this protein, then how the protein interacts with other yeah, enzymes yeah. and drugs. And then just the first part is very uh, expensive. Then the second part, you know, that's on top of it. Okay, okay. Interesting. Um, so sometimes, I'm curious your thoughts on this. There's kind of, it feels like sometimes there's like a mechanical um, evolution happening that's like, you know, MacBooks and cell phones and it's like electricity and transistors and stuff. And you know some machine learning kind of fits in there, and then there's also biological evolution that's happening um, with cells and whatnot. And you know it's sometimes, and we're getting like CRISPR and these sort of things. We're actually able to start to um, almost have like you know the GitHub for the, yep. <laughs> the DNA and yep. um, print out an organism, right? And so sometimes I'm wondering if this is like your mental model of it as well about these two paths of. Um, evolution almost you could almost imagine a world that was like where this machines like supersede biology or vice versa like does that even make sense or am i thinking about that right yeah there's a couple interesting things that we can look to the past that may be interesting philosophically about thinking about the future so actually biology doesn't just work under evolution but it does things to improve its ability to evolve so for example on the protein folding side there's proteins that help fold other proteins called chaperones and the name is actually kind of cute and evocative because if they don't fold correctly, they kind of aggregate together and the chaperones kind of avoid that from happening. Um, and, and, so, uh, you know, and so chaperones allow evolution of proteins to be a little imperfect because if you're not great at folding, that's okay. The chaperone will, will clean it up. And so what that means is that a lot easier to jump from A to B. It's a lot easier because you have all these intermediate points where you don't have to be all that great. And so towards that end, evolution doesn't just make things better, it does meta-evolution. It evolves its ability to evolve. And these meta things I, I always find intriguing. And machine learning is a really interesting example of meta-evolution. You know, so, because you can even start with basic tools, you know, uh, and it's actually really interesting watching other animals use tools. It's not apparently not just chimps. Uh, tons of animals will use tools in different ways. And so tools was a first step. Machine learning is now such an ultimate version of that tool because it's a tool for the mind, you know, that really can catalyze things. And, you know, started, I don't know if you ever saw this interview with Steve Jobs where uh, he was so poetic in describing what he, how he viewed a computer, that he talked about how a human being running on its own could never be as fast or as efficient as like a cheetah. But a human being with a bicycle, you know, can achieve great speeds and great efficiencies. And that he always, uh, his, the famous quote is that he viewed the, the computer as the bicycle for the mind. I think where this is now getting refined is that, you know, uh, for, for anything mental, obviously machine learning gets very interesting. And it's not just an individual computer, but a series of network computers. And so where this is evolving, I think is, I think we should think of these as tools, not as replacements. Uh, and I can't imagine that there would be replacements. And anyone who's fearing uh, AI should just ask Siri some interesting questions. You know, and you'll, you'll see how great AI is. Um, you know, so it's something where there's a long, long way to go, and I think we're going to be so lockstep with it that people, it will just be a natural part of our evolution of tools and ourselves. Interesting. So you're, so you're really thinking like um, biology is going to have this synthesis with technology, and it's going to augment like a tool in, in the hand of a caveman or something, but it'll be you know, some like AI thing plugged into your brain, I guess. <laughs> yeah, you know, at every stage too, people were always terrified of technology. So a great example is uh, Charles Adams, I think, who's like the great grandson of John Quincy Adams, or John Adams, uh, grandson of John Quincy Adams. So uh, this was during the period of like uh, Thoreau and the big networks that everyone was building in the country were trains. And people were terrified about trains. And, uh, and so, you know, Charles Adams said, you know, we don't ride on trains, the trains ride on us. And now it seems very quaint, like no one's worried about trains. 
right? Um, but it was such a revolutionary technology and allowed us to do so much more that that change was itself terrifying. And this speaks to a lot of the concerns that we are quite possibly going through another version of an industrial revolution uh, towards AI. And as in any industrial revolution, there's always the concern that we have to have for people and jobs and how to help people get to the other side. I don't think anyone thinks that we'd be better off without factories, even though factories displace jobs. Uh, but uh, hopefully it created better jobs in time. And so I think now what we have to think about is how to help people uh, on this transition and just not to, not to ignore them. Uh, but I think it's obvious where we're going. Yeah, I saw somebody made an interesting uh, point one time. They were showing me like this photo. I don't know if you've seen this, but it was like a photo of a, a desk and there was like a laptop and a cell phone and like um, in the corner there was a little like desk plant and uh, the caption was like, what's the most complex object on this table? Yeah. You might have seen this, right? Yeah, 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 I did, yeah. And yeah. Um, of course, it's like the little plant because, you know, it's uh, self-replicating, um, it's self-healing, like if you yeah. cut off a leaf, it grows it back. Yep. Um, it's even self-assembling from like this little seed, you just put in like sunlight and water and somehow it yep. grows the whole thing and it's like, you, you can imagine like a, almost like a, you put a seed in the ground and put water and sunlight, it turns into an iPhone. Yep. Like we're so far away from that. Or if you cut your iPhone in half, does it regrow the other piece? Yep. yep. So it's like, in some ways, biology is just, you know, so far ahead of anything we've built in the more, more of the hardware side. But on the other hand, it's like, even, even the big stuff, like you can grow entire forests and these things, like we've never built anything that big. Um, but then, you know, I guess uh, the hardware side can do things that biology can't too, like these crazy computations per second and stuff yeah. like that. Um, I don't know, do you have any thoughts? This, it sounds like you, you really kind of already answered it, but do you have any additional? Yeah, you know, I think it's, it's, there's lots of interesting angles here. So one of my favorites is that uh, we talk about tools. Uh, many of us might view penicillin as a tool, like it's a, something that has saved so many lives, except we didn't create penicillin. Penicillin was discovered when uh, Fleming put a fungi and bacteria next to each other and let them fight it out. And he discovered that the fungi could kill the bacteria with penicillin. And so it actually was not man-made at all. It was just something that nature actually came up with. In that sense, it was a tool that nature used, a very potent one that has saved many human lives. And so I think where this gets interesting, maybe one angle to take here to talk about is what do we love about, um, about co computers? You know, I think about when I was a kid, so I, um, I moved to, uh, my parents moved in the middle of, uh, f at the end of fifth grade for me. So we showed up at the new place and I, it was in the summer, so I didn't like meet anyone in school. And, uh, and, to, and to make things work for sort of a geeky introverted kid, they also got me a computer. Uh, and, and so, uh, so I you know, spent the summer learning how to program. It was fantastic. And you think about like, why do we love programming? It's so interesting to like take something simple and then copy paste edit and then build on top of that, and then create that into a, into a procedure, and then layer up things on top, and uh, abstract higher and higher. And now you think about all the tools that make it even more possible, like GitHub and all these libraries and open source, you can do very complicated things in Python relatively quickly, because you're building on top of all of this. Uh, imagine, I think, where we are with biology now, kind of like the homebrew computer club, you know, of maybe the 60s where people are starting to build Apple IIs. And we're starting to see a lot of people interested in D, uh, DIY hacking, and it's just all over the place. So, um, one, and there's super cool things to do. Like one version of this is that, I don't know if you've heard about these things about fecal transplants. It's kind of crazy, but so they did this with mice, that there's like thin mice and there's fat mice. And you take uh, the, the, uh, the, you know, the feces uh, from the intestines of thin mice, put into fat mice, so you recolonize their microbiome. The fat mice become thin. And so this is something well proven and actually is now done in cases of extreme obesity in humans, surgically. Uh, but apparently there are people doing this DIY as well, uh, going to the bottom side. Uh, um, uh, yeah, yeah. And, and so this is just the beginning where people I think are gonna do all this crazy shit, so to speak. Uh, you know, uh, uh, and, and so it's very early though. Like maybe it's even closer to the 50s where people were like messing around with their cars. You know, and you could mess around with the car in the 50s because if you look in your car now, like it's like 200 computers and a bunch of stuff you can't mess with. Um, uh, and so it was much simpler. We can do that. I think we're going to start seeing much more. Uh, biohacking is already a thing, but I think with all these technologies and all these robotics that you can even get your house, you can get little pipetting robots for 3K, which is like what PCs used to cost, you know, when we were kids. Um, I think we're going to start to see that. And 
where this will go is that all the biohacking that people are doing now, which is like funding games, much like when you know I was a kid, it was just all funding games and so on. I wrote, I wrote computer games. Eventually, that'll become much more legitimate, and people will abstract on top. And so you have these kits uh, and these open source, and and especially as biology looks more like uh, less like pipetting, where you just liquid handling and more like programming. Um, there's tons of cases where you can just already have Python libraries to drive through robots to do tons of interesting things. I, I think that's where that whole paradigm of compute applied to biology could have the best of both worlds, but it may take us like 30 years to get there. That's really interesting. Yeah, it's cool to think about like the biohacking and like the early in the computer club from the home, yeah. homebrew days and yep. um, people just kind of experimenting, I guess, sounds like on themselves because it may be really dangerous to do it on other people. Uh, yeah, I think it may be illegal to do it on other people. Yeah. It, it, I don't know if it's illegal doing it yourself, but it also doesn't sound advisable, but. Yeah, wow, okay. Um, okay, so maybe one more, um, uh, just a couple questions on this one, in another area, and then I'm happy to open it to questions from the audience as well. So let's just, I'm curious to hear about um, your career, and yeah, how are we doing on time? Yeah, I got 10 minutes. We're good. About 10 minutes, okay. I'll go quickly then. Um, so I'm just curious if you have any, career advice to the people in the audience. Um, you know, how did you think about becoming a professor at Stanford? Um, like the original idea for folding at home. Now you're a partner at Andreessen Horowitz. You know, like, I'm just curious, how do you think about finding what you love and having an impact and all, the, all those things? I think there's a couple of key things that if I look at myself and look at other people that have been uh, successful and especially more successful, um, there are a couple of key things I see. So first off is that you always want to work with the very, very best people. It, it's amazing. Like, uh, you know, the, the, the hackneyed line is if you're the smartest person in the room, you've got to find another room. You know, so working with the best people your whole career, that alone um, is important. And unfortunately, the best way to do that is, I think, from the beginning. So the reason to go to a place like Stanford is not necessarily that the professors teach the best, because it, probably that's not true. But the social network that you have of the people, the students there and the professors there is going to be surrounding you where you're training with the very best athletes and you're being pushed the whole way. And so, and that, of course, will set you up to work for the best companies or, to, or whatever career path you take. So that's one part. Second part is that I think when I look at people who have been successful, sometimes they're people who are just like natural born athletes. They're like just brilliant. But actually... I think when actually, especially having now, like, you know, it's been next, this summer is my 25th uh, undergrad uh, grad, um, uh, um, reunion. So 25 years after coming out of college, so I have some data on that. The people, there are a few that were just super geniuses that were did fine, but actually the people who were most successful were ones who had those networks, but then were relentless in terms of trying to improve themselves. And it almost didn't matter where they started. It's just like, it's this, you know, this thing where like, um, if you improve 1% a day, and that's actually harder to do than uh, say, but even 1% a day is tremendous over 10 years. And so too often people are either not thinking about self-improvement, they don't know how to even approach that, or they don't take it seriously. And I look at the best people, they're always reading, they're always learning, they're always improving, they're always thinking about what they're doing wrong in process. Uh, and that relentlessness of trying to do better is, is really key. And then the third thing I would say is uh, the mistake that I see people make is if they get the first two, the, the last mistake is that they don't set their sights high enough. That if you have those two things, you should be able to do something really, truly world-changing. And that I, I think people sometimes go conservative and they say they'd rather do 100% of something good rather than 50% of something great. But I think 50% of something world-changing, or and it usually ends up being like 90% of something world-changing, um, is really where I think all the satisfaction and all the impact is going to be. And so I think with those three combinations of things, people who, who can do that will easily uh, have a, a huge impact. And it also becomes a virtuous cycle. You do great things, people know you for that. And so then you get other opportunities. And you're working with other great people. And then, you know, you can see how this could uh, feed forward. It probably builds your confidence, too, to think bigger. So Yeah, and I think confidence is a part of it. I think there's a difference in my mind between confidence and cocky. You know, uh, confidence is... Like, you know, there's always this, like, moment in startups and other areas in life and research where you feel like, oh, this whole thing is fucked, you know? And you just have to, like, so I'm a Patriots fan, and so this game was a really great example of that. Like, you know, like, it, I was telling my daughters, like, I was trying to 
make them feel comfortable with the fact that there's not going to be a happy ending uh, with that. But you know, they just uh, were relentless in terms of just just pushing it forward. And it's confidence in that sense of not like I'm perfect or or whatever. It's just like I, I, we'll find a way to get done. Um, versus cocky, which is like, ah, you know, I, I, I'm, I don't need to learn, I don't need to do all the things. So I think that that sense of confidence tied into the other things is, is a key part of this. Yeah, so it sounds like surround yourself with the best people, don't stop learning, never stop learning, and think bigger. And push super big. And, and that's been the biggest mistake that I found, even in my career, I wish, uh, which I did more earlier and not realizing that I could, you know, I got to Stanford, I had degrees in physics. You know, what did I learn about designing? What did I know about designing drugs? But Stanford is a great environment. I surrounded myself with great people. Uh, you could design drugs there. And that, you know, 10 years later, we have drugs that are spun out into companies. It's something where if I was a little bit more confident in shooting bigger, we could have done that five years earlier. You know, and then again, that would have spun up even better if I was five years ahead of where I am now. Yeah, that's great. Okay, I think we have just maybe five minutes left, but are there any questions from the audience? And uh, just grab a catch box if you don't mind. Sorry, I should have left more time for questions. But. Hi, um, it was a really interesting talk. Um, I have a question on sort of the potential of deep learning, especially to improve diagnostics, like you say, mammograms, for instance, terrible, uh, terrible resolution. What um, is happening that's interesting, or if it's not happening, what needs to happen on the analog to digital conversion side, like the both sensors and signal processing that I'm guessing really needs to get significantly better before the deep learning can really have much effect? So this is a very uh, important question. Uh, so in terms of what the sensor can do, you know, many of us in this room have sensors on us right now, whether it's on your phone, whether it's on a wearable or something like that. One of the intriguing things is a lot of these sensors, they benefit from the uh, mobile supply chain. So the cost of these sensors are going to zero, and that's why they're and, and mobile device manufacturers want to differentiate themselves. So we have tons of sensors everywhere. Problem is that they're sort of they're not clinical grade, and so a typical doctor would look at any individual measurement and say, well, that is not at the same precision as my device, and so I'm not going to be able to use it. What's intriguing is that if you use what's in those sensors as features for machine learning where you learn from gold standard stuff. And this could be supervised machine learning, could be semi-supervised machine learning. There's interesting tricks in both. Uh, then you could actually leverage these devices. So uh, a company of our foil, Cardiogram, can use the Apple Watch to detect whether you have atrial fibrillation or other healthcare problems. On the App Store reviews, there are review, multiple reviews that says Cardiogram saved my life. Even though the individual sensors there are not clinical grade, the ML allows you to sort of elevate this in a very powerful way. Um, sorry. Uh, so, uh, thanks for the talk today. It was really interesting. Um, I'm, I'm kind of curious about this analogy that was being made between kind of hacking software and hacking biology, um, particularly in the in the theme of bugs. So, like we see with with software that it's it's extremely difficult to write software that has no bugs, particularly. Um, as it gets more complicated, um, and so, and but on the and on the other hand, with biology, we see you guys observe that biology is more complicated than our technology, and we we know far less about it. So, as we're hacking ourselves, how do we deal with this problem of introdu introducing bugs inadvertently into our own biology? Yeah, no, this is a very deep question, and. So how do we handle bugs on, on the compute side? I mean, there's various tools we can have to find them and various ways we just deal with them. So, you know, um, memory leaks are not fun, but you can, you know, and you could try to hunt them all down or you could have coding means that don't have to deal with them. I and mean, we can go all the way to different, and you can have unit tests and there's all these and regression tests. I think all of that stuff can be applied over. I think the difference in biology and where biology might be interesting on the compute side is biology has tons of backup systems. And so, for instance, if you don't have oxygen, you can go anaerobic. You have, most people don't realize, we have two immune systems. We have one with antibodies and one that's the innate immune system that comes from the bacterial days. And so we've got all these multiple layers and, so, uh, and backup systems such that you can often sort of, uh, pull down one protein and um, organism will still survive because it'll go through a backup mechanism. That's partially what makes it so complicated, but this is a sense of now complex can be anti-fragile. And, and that's going to be the, the secret here. And, and part of it is now understanding how to surf the anti-fragility. Okay. 
time for maybe one more question. Steal the last question here. Um, I'm curious about, you know, you mentioned Alzheimer's kind of making its way to the top, thinking one, well, how does a, a, a disease like that, you know, supersede heart disease? Um, and thinking more about our diet and what we consume perhaps that could cause that? Are you involved with any research that is looking at the, the cause of this, you know, increasingly, um, you know, devastating disease? Yeah, diet is really key and something I think a lot about. And actually part of also what's wrapped into diet is our microbiome. We talked about for fat versus thin, but there's tons of evidence wow. that even diseases like Alzheimer's may have a microbiome component. And so it, most people forget that we have more bacterial cells in our body than human cells. And that by weight, it's like a significant, I think it's like 30 pounds of bacteria or something like that. Something quite significant. That we are, are, are actually not as human as we think we are. We're a, a, sort of an ecosystem. And so uh, food is a key part of this. And even to the point where, you know, these bacteria are interacting with our bodies by sending hormones. And so even the point where you have a craving for things, I'm always suspicious that what's the craving? Is it you or is it your bacteria in your gut? sending hormones that get to your brain that make you get what they want. And so with all this into play, I think there's all these interesting things that we'll see where uh, by new research and neuroscience, microbiome and other things, we'll be able to tackle uh, these things in new ways. What I just don't know is to what degree this is tackleable. And because in some sense, it's our success in these other diseases that make this the, the hard one. Kind of like in coding, if you profile a code and you sort of get rid of the right living steps, you always get a new right living step. So this is the new one, and I think, I assume after we tackle uh, Alzheimer's, there'll be something else that comes up when we're 150 or so on. And so this is just going to be a part of what we have to deal with, and it's a, obviously a major challenge, and I, I'm sort of circling around this because I don't know what the cure to Alzheimer's is at the moment. Uh, but uh, I'm confident that with these new technologies, we'll have at least uh, some huge firepower to, to pour upon it. Awesome. Thank you, Vijay, for joining us, and let's give him a round of applause.